I, uh, I should also begin by thanking the Alexander Institute for inviting me. I, uh, I don't think I've ever been as well fed in my entire life. <laughs> um, I, so now I have to sing for my supper. Uh, normally one sings first and then and gets one supper, but um, it's the other way around with me, so that, that takes a bit of pressure off. Um, so uh, you, you may note that the title of my talk has changed ever so slightly. Um, I'm not going to tell you why. I'm going to have provided a couple of visual clues uh, so that you can work it out for yourselves. Uh, I'm sure it will become very transparent. Uh, the uh, picture on the left is the, is the original uh, poster for one of the classic Cold War films, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. So you can, you can figure out the title as I, as I speak. I did, before I begin to speak, I wanted to provide a, just a little plug for our new project, uh, which is one year uh, into a, three years, and if you want to check it out, there's, uh, there's the um, URL for you there. Um, right, so, so our conference um, has been reflecting on um, really the extended trajectory of the of the. 20th century's defining event, uh, the, the Cold War. Because the tensions that this phenomenon generated both predate and, and persist beyond it. Uh, the Soviet Union's Cold War on democracy has seemingly been substituted by Putin's rather opportunistic information war, arguably uh, a greater threat to Western democracy than the rather lumbering Soviet propaganda machine. Inevitably, parallels between Soviet and post-Soviet propaganda technologies and techniques continue to be drawn. Um, and uh, I'm just going to draw your attention to the title of one quite influential recent report. Um, I won't read the title to it, so it's not the most elegant of titles, um, but at least it tells you what it's, uh, what it's about. And, and there is a whole cottage industry of reports of, of, of this kind. And like, like others in, in that, within that industry, it portrays digital technology as offering new tools capable of unprecedented disruption and deception. Russia's current war on democracy, uh, the report, like the others uh, in the series argues, is waged not only by centrally coordinated state actors, but also by sub-state social media uh, uh, users and online um, commentators. And the logic of this kind of model, this paradigm, this way of looking at things is reflected in a, in a recent article um, uh, whose details you'll find there. Again, I won't read you the full quote. Um, first, false or misleading comment, content is created by Russian-affiliated media outlets like RT. Second, you have false, false multipliers, trolls and bots that amplify that content. And third, mutually reinforcing digital entities which perpetuate the narrative. Now, what I want to do today is to suggest that this model provides a limited understanding of what is problematically called information war. I want to challenge the linearity of the narrative um, that uh, such reports embrace. I want to question the assumptions they make that the media environments targeted by Russia's propaganda operation are somehow fixed and passive. And I want to oppose the notion of a coordinated disinformation campaign integrating broadcasters, trolls, and bots, together with the underlying assumption that the organizations which implement those strategies are somehow homogeneous and completely lacking in their own agency. The digital re revolution uh, has produced a hyper-networked media sphere in which propagators of state media campaigns struggle to adjust to active audiences, to the greater access those audiences have to alternative narratives, and to accelerating multi-directional um, information flows. Um, and those uh, 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 challenges, I think, necessitate, necessis, necessitate a series of reframings, and uh, it's, the, it's those reframings that 
provide the, uh, the uh, inspiration for our project. First of all, there's the reframing by researchers like myself of conventional linear propaganda models. Then there's the Kremlin's own uh, difficulties in reframing the propaganda operations that it deploys in domestic contexts for international audiences. And then thirdly, there's the enhanced tendency for participatory audiences to reframe those narratives yet again. Um, I want to highlight just one consequence that connects all three reframings. The imbrications, the overlaps uh, of the competing narratives, logics, and identities facilitated by um, hyper-networked media sphere. I'm going to draw on media event theory, about which a little more shortly. And I want to target just one episode in a single media event phenomenon, the notorious interview conducted by international broadcaster RT with the two suspects identified by British security services in connection with the poisoning in Salisbury of double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia. Uh, so now the subtitle should be all only too clear to you. Now, this one incident probably seems far too ephemeral to support my broader argument. However, uh, the transnational narratives, identities, and networks which characterize the mediatized space in which interstate information battles occur, I believe, can't be captured solely by processing vast amounts of quantitative data. Rather, I think we should seek the sort of... Um, points of convergence, the nodal points, to adapt a concept from Ernesto Laclau, at which these phenomena intersect. And Artie's bizarre interview, I would suggest, represents just one such point. Um, so, media event theory, which I won't dwell on in detail, originates in uh, Diane and Katz's uh, seminal work of that name, media events, uh, depicting how state and media collaboration, uh, state and media collaborate in the production of shared national rituals. Diane and Katz's theory has been adapted uh, to include non-ceremonial disruptive events like um, terrorist attacks. It's also been heavily critiqued for portraying them as unifying occasions rather than as the site at which discursive tensions play out. And this more agonistic view of media events gains traction, of course, from the multi-platform opportunities that digitization grants to non-state actors to redefine events and, and, um, and also from the global circulation of information that it, bring, it brings. Nonetheless, the idea of state media collaboration collusion is retained um, even in Nick Caldry and Andreas Hepp's recent recasting of media events in this new dispensation that I'm describing as, and again the, the quote is there, uh, certain situated, thickened, centering performances, so the idea of centering is still there, of mediated communication that reach a wide and diverse multi multiplicity of audience and audiences and participants. And Caldry and Hepp and others clarify that audience appropriations of these centering performances mean that the construction of a mediated center contains, or rather remains, a contested process. And I think it's into this dynamic that the Salisbury uh, media event can be inserted. Um, what's more, media events occurring within interstate conflict uh, produce actually or, or involve several mediated centers pulling in different directions, generating multiple narratives, each of which is contested both from within domestic media spaces and beyond the respective state boundaries. And this makes, I, makes it, I think, even more imperative to identify those points of convergence, those nodal points at which the narratives and the thickened uh, meanings that they generate uh, come together. Um, so, very briefly, uh, what we've been doing, I and the rest of my research team, um, is, is looking at the 
co-construction of the Salisbury event by multiple actors. We've done a comparative, or still are doing, a comparative discourse analysis involving cross-platform cross coverage. We looked at BBC One, BBC World, Russian Channel One, and RT. Uh, contextualized through selective data analysis, so I'm not completely averse to counting. Uh, I read, but I also count as well, when it suits me. Um, uh, particularly when it comes to audience responses, as you'll see. Um, for each of eight points we identified, so we didn't, obviously it's, a, it was, it's an ongoing event, it's still unfolding, as you know. We identified eight points, um, and for each of those eight points we looked at New, uh, news broadcasts on the day and two days before and after. We also, uh, um, so there they are, again I, I, I won't read through all of them, we also examined each channel's website coverage of the, the developments, relevant developments, but there we restricted our analysis to just five of the eight periods culminating in the RT interview and those are the ones coloured in, in red. Um, and what our uh, discourse analysis has, has done or has highlighted are uh, the conflicting narratives at play. So by focusing on um, key terms, um, media genres, and a series of representational techniques and procedures, we identified the range of actors involved in articulating the narratives. We tried to get at the institutional cultures in which they're embedded and the way these narratives interplay and respond to one another. We also are trying to describe the particular media logics, those of securitization, neoliberalism, and what we've called journalistic professionalism or professionalization, uh, which shape how these narratives are deployed. And this apparatus, taken as a whole is designed to demonstrate how the location of nodal points like the RT interview can really capture the flows and the intersections which define contemporary media events as Caldry and Hep have described them. Now, so to move to the analysis itself, and I'm, you'll forgive me if I concentrate on the findings rather than take you through each methodological step. Um, I think the first thing to say is that the very facts of the Salisbury story foreground the roles of the respective security apparatuses in carrying out and covering up the poisoning, identifying the suspects, and addressing threats posed to public safety and confidence. Um, indeed, uh, security really became the driver of, of, of the narratives since um, the restrictions imposed by the both security apparatus is on the uh, flow of information into the public domain, created multiple gaps in each state's account. And this fed the speculation on which the story thrived and continues to thrive. So who exactly was Sergei Skripal? Has he ceased collaborating with MI6? How was he targeted and why? Where is he now? Um, how exactly was Navichok smuggled into the UK? Uh, who in the chain of demand, command gave the order to kill him? How were the suspects identified? Who are they really and where are they now? So if you're looking at me to provide answers to all those questions, you're, uh, you're, you're looking at the wrong person. I, I'm not sure that any of those questions have been sort of sat have answered satisfactorily. But it's, you know, it's, it's the securitized context that, that um, you know, all of these gaps have created that have made it the BBC's duty as the establishment broadcaster to align with the state and maintaining public calm. And as a result, alternative theories that sort of circulating in the online world tended to be marginalized, including some fairly plausible ones. For example, the, the idea that the poisoning was carried out by a Russian state actor without Putin's explicit um, approval. And that, interestingly, is a narrative that Russian state media also excluded. So there's a sort of a collusion across, uh, as well as within uh, uh, sort of um, ad ad adversarial environments. And as a result, with the BBC, you've got a series of quite interesting encounters. 
uh, and a number of very, very prominent BBC presenters completely nonplussed. So there was a, an interview that Kirsty Walk, who, who fronts perhaps the best news magazine program on the BBC Newsnight, when she interviewed Mikhail Khodorkovsky, um, when he gave an account of Putin as a fact a weak leader who's in hock to criminal groups, she just didn't know how to respond. It didn't compute either with Khodorkovsky's status as a brutally repressed dissident or with the dominant narrative about Putin's culpability for the, for the poisoning. And then there was Andrew Marr, who's, who's perhaps the leading political interviewer in the UK, and he suffered a similar mental block when he was trying to understand an absolutely crystal clear explanation that Russian state responsibility doesn't necessarily entail direct culpability. He just, it just didn't compute. And this is a smart guy, um, but so ingrained has this kind of uh, dominant narrative um, have become that, 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 that it, ex it excludes the possibility of even quite plausible alternatives. The securitization closely aligns with mediatization, and that can be best illustrated by the, um, by the series of... Uh, grainy CCTV images of the two suspects, and these have now almost become sort of um, global icons of the, uh, of the event. Um, let me go back to a, a slide for a moment. Um, so uh, the growing imperative to forestall threats coincides with the need to shape the flow of information into the public sphere. And so Salisbury initiated sustained state media collaboration that did indeed seem to hark back to Diane and Katz, so from the choreographed British police statements through the BBC News's dramatized opening segments featuring Theresa May's announcement of sanctions, and then to poor Victoria Skripal's tour of Russian television talk show studios. The poor woman was dragged out day after day after day uh, to, uh, she's the cousin of Yulia Skripal, uh, to counter the... Um, each sort of new step in the, in, or each new twist in the British media narrative. And then, there were, but then Julia Skripal uh, gave this meticulously planned video rebuttal of claims on the Russian media that she was a, somehow a prisoner of MI6. Uh, and then the famous interview to which I'll come. So um, part of this collusion, as, as I'm suggesting, involves sort of um, mutual media rebuttals um, and sorry, no, we are not quite at that point yet. Um, at the height of the crisis, Channel One's political talk show, Vremia Parkajat, which, which you talked about yesterday, didn't you? Um, and as you said, it's, it's very frequent. And during the Salisbury crisis, it was putting out new editions every day, um, each ridiculing the latest Western media allegation. But the BBC, too, closely scrutinized Russian media coverage. At the end of her report on Putin's claims to have found the suspects, remember? It was Putin who first said, we found them. Uh, the BBC Moscow correspondent, at the end of her report, it ended, all eyes are on state Russian TV to see how Russia will respond. And this inter-broadcaster dynamic meant that the, you know, the Salisbury is a global media story was effectively co-created by opposing state-aligned um, outlets. And this, I think, belies the, this paradox belies the apparent status of Salisbury as a classic media event. And so, too, do the uh, appropriations of digital platforms. It's true these new affordances are undoubtedly very powerful tools. And Russia made strategic use of Twitter, for example, to mock its uh, adversaries. Um, so one example was the creation of a viral highly likely hashtag. Um, this emanates from Sergei Lavrov, in fact. It was he who started this hashtag to ridicule British Prime Minister's declaration that Russian state culpability was highly likely. Um, and so you've got the uh, tweet from the Minister of Foreign Affairs to see if thanks to Mrs. May, and then they have a shot of British weather. Who's responsible? It's highly likely that the Russians are to, uh, are to blame. So you get the idea. But they used and used and overused it uh, ad nauseum. 
Uh, and then there's the um, uh, the um, <coughs> uh, the rather uh, tasteless um, um, before and after images of, of Julius Skripal. So the idea that um, you know you take Novich, Novichok and look what it does to your uh, your appearance. Um, so uh, what is it? Just believe the magic of Novichok. Um, now, of course, the, the, these strategies were nonetheless deployed alongside a very different strategy, the one taken on the likes of Vremya Pakajat, which took a very forensic approach, frame by frame, analyzing each kind of, uh, well, for example, the Julius Skripal inter interview, the statement, it, it did a frame by frame analysis, showing that the whole thing was a, was a, was a fake and a, and a, a construct. Um, then you have the Russian language Twitter sphere, which, which I've talked about. Um, and, and yes, uh, despite what I said at the beginning, there is an argument for saying that Russia managed to in, in, um, intervene in British online media space. So we did look at the um, responses to BBC web reports. And sure enough, nine of the top 10 comments of several of them, uh, well, particularly the one uh, relating to uh, the expulsion of 23 Russian diplomats were hostile to the UK. That's the BBC website. So um, who knows? But the, it is at least plausible that, that, that there, are, there, there may have been some Russian influence there. But more important point is I think we, we need to distinguish between um, direct instrumentalizations of new media tools of the sort I've just been describing and the indirect structural tensions they generate. Those same information gaps that I've talked about and which reinforce the securitization, mediatization access also act as stimuli for multiple uh, non-state and sub-state actors that inhabit a very complex global media ecology. And they include, amongst others, independent news outlets whose relative freedom sometimes reflects the opportunities offered by um, digital media environment. So in Russia, you know, as, uh, we have the likes of Kommersant and Mediazona and Dorst and Novaya Gazeta, etc., etc., all of whom made quite important interventions in the, in the coverage of the, uh, of the event. International broadcasters that operate in different legislative and commercial contexts from their domestic equivalents and therefore are obliged to behave differently. RT, particularly when it was under pressure from Ofcom, did change its approach quite dramatically uh, and became a very, very different outlet from, from, the, uh, from what you were seeing on domestic Russian television. Equally, if you've ever cared to watch BBC World News, uh, you'll find it's a very, very different beast altogether from um, domestic Russian television. Much more tabloid, much more careless and free and easy, and much more likely to stray beyond the, this very sort of um, controlled set of narratives. Uh, and because the BBC is op world is operating in a very, very different environment. And then there's the citizen activists, so the little-known investigative outfit Bellingcat um, claimed that it identified the two Skripal suspects as GRU officers, aided by a Russian online publication called The Insider. I might say a bit more about that shortly. Then you have social media trolls that I've talked about, and we shouldn't forget the pranksters. Um, Poor, long-suffering former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson uh, was, uh, was the victim of a hoax phone call from the Armenian Prime Minister during the Salisbury uh, crisis. I, Boris Johnson is, is, is Britain's answer to Donald Trump. Um, I'm not sure who that does more of a disservice to, but um, my hope is that Boris Johnson will eventually be exposed as an FSB agent. Uh, uh, he certainly behaves like one. <laughs> Um, but the, these actors, the, they inhabit an environment in which national allegiances are thoroughly intertwined. So Khmer Sant, which I mentioned, has a UK branch. Russian trolls are indeed hard to differentiate from domestic observers who share hostility to the BBC, of which there are a lot. Um, the Insider collaborates with Bellingcat, which is fronted by an English uh, gentleman. RT employs English-speaking staff, staff acculturated to the context in which they work. Um, and they, they are sometimes liable to go rogue. And remember the spate of um, post-Crimea live on-air protests and resignations. 
Um, and that, of course, brings us neatly to RT's interview. Um, many were puzzled that it came via RT. The Kremlin's initial concern seemed to be with keeping home audiences on side with its hedged account attributing blame either to British intelligence or to non-Russian state actors. Um, and initially, English-speaking audiences did indeed endorse RT's skepticism about British official accounts. So we looked at a, um, its uh, Skripal playlist um, consisting of 60 videos with a combined view, viewer numbers of 1.6 million, which is quite a lot. Uh, these videos were upvoted 32,000 times compared with only 4,200 downvotes. So well, they seem to be doing their job. Uh, on one video, 73% of comments referred to a British cons state conspiracy, 27% noted inconsistencies in British claims, and then in response to another one, 35% suggested conspiracy, 95% were critical of Britain. So this is RT doing its job quite effectively. Then, on September the 5th, 2018, the BBC reported the identification of uh, Petrov, Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bashirov via CCTV images, the timing of whose release reconfirms British security's central involvement in the media management of the conflict. And a week later, uh, as, I, as I said, Putin announced that Petrov and Bashir had been found. They were just ordinary civilians and might be a good idea if they contact the media. Following day, as if by magic, RT released a YouTube interview available simultaneously in Russian and with English subtitles conducted by none other than Margarita Simanyan, RT's editor-in-chief and Putin's close confidant. In the interview, Simanyan asked the men who they were, they were tourists visiting Salisbury Cathedral with its 123-metre spire, a detail that corresponded suspiciously to Salisbury's Wikipedia entry. Uh, she inquired about their jobs. They claimed to be fitness entrepreneurs. Um, perhaps we can... Oh, right, OK. Um, and, and then she asked them what, uh, if they'd carried Novichok in a perfume bottle, to which they indignantly asked, why would men be carrying women's perfume? And this connected to an odd sexual subtext. When asked about their friendship, they refused to discuss details, provoking speculation that they might be gay, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, these, uh, these were no brave spies who came in from the cold. They were spies who slunk back from the snow. Because she, she asked them, why did you go twice to Salisbury? Uh, well, the first time there was a bit of snow, and, and, and we, we had to come back. These were big, sort of beefy Russian young men. Um, and responses to the interview were an unmitigated disaster. 74% of English language comments were critical. Some noted the interview had changed their opinion of the whole affair. Not a very convincing interview at all, said one. I wasn't doubting the Russian government until I saw this interview. Then uh, another, um, um, uh, well, I'll come to the other one uh, shortly. So, again, the percentages show that um, only 16% were critical of Britain. And on, when you get to the Russian version, interestingly, the comments were equally critical. So you have one declaring, one comment. Until the, today, I perceived this script story as Britain's provocation. But once I saw these two idiots, my view was shaken. Uh, so the idea of RT as an agile instrument of the Russian state begins to fall apart. As another comment put it, by posting this video and also not disabling comments, you've totally screwed yourselves. And I work out the Russian for yourselves. Um, and even Simanyan's efforts to signal some ironic distance were, were misread as an act of state um, trolling. So it's a mystery why RT was chosen as the vehicle for the Russian denial, why Simanyan, not a practiced interviewer, uh, at least not recently, should have led the interview or conducted the interview. Was it an effort to add authenticity in the pitch to domestic audiences for whom an interview with a familiar propagandist like Kiselyov might have raised suspicions? Who knows? What is clear is that the, um, uh, the, is the difficulties that states now encounter in separating domestic and international audiences, and that's just one of the structural effects of the global media ecology. 
Um, I was going to talk also about another, rid well, I will talk briefly about another ridiculed aspect of Simanyan's interview, her performance of journalistic professionalism. Um, she tried to sort of, um, sort of perform this uh, objective skepticism towards the suspects, um, and it didn't work. However, rather than dismissing this as the act of a cynical propagandist, I think we'd be much better served um, you know, looking seriously at, about, uh, um, or to, to, not to see the likes of RT as just a, a, a collection of cynical propagandists. These people do see themselves as part of a global community of media professionals, and indeed RT, Yes, it's been condemned many times for, uh, for fake news and so on, but it has also won a series of quite prestigious international awards. And to ignore that aspect of, of, of these actors, to not to recognize that they do have their own agency, I think is to arrive at a completely distorted and reductive uh, um, understanding of how uh, Russian propaganda, if you can call it that, works. Um, I should also say that the BBC itself um, uh, is sort of a victim of, um, of, of some of these media logics um, at work. Journalistic professionalism is one, the sort of neoliberal uh, sensationalism, the desire to increase clickbait and clicks um, uh, and scoops and so on is, is, is another. Um, Ria Novosti tried to kind of um, channel that, uh, that particular logic when it claimed that the um, many outlets wanted to secure the interview and certain radio stations, meaning Echa Moskvi, Echa Moskvi, worked up a crazed activism. But then there's the BBC uh, Moscow correspondent who uh, claimed a coup when she um, supposedly confirmed the identity of the two suspects by going all the way to the Far East and interviewing members of the community, when, according to her own tweet, Kamersant had got there before her. So this, this is that sort of um, same media logic at work in, in British media space as well. And I think then I can, seeing as I'm, I'm out of time, I can miss that um, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, coping strategies. Um, uh, so one of, one of the exchanges was she, she asked, um, um, I think it was Peter of, are you a, 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 a agent? And he responds rather than have we? And that turned into a kind of meme that played out as a post-Soviet form of stiob, which I argue is, a, is, is part of the... Um, uh, a coping strategy that, that um, Russian media actors have developed. So there are my conclusions, which I won't read through uh, all of them. I think my, what the central point is that the information war paradigm is not empirically wrong, but uh, it does occlude and cover up and ignore the complexity of the conditions in which the practices it describes uh, occur. And that you, if you look at these nodal points, as I call them, you can really get at some of these, the, this interplay of forces uh, that will give you a much more accurate and a much better picture of the, of the struggle that state-line broadcasters, including the BBC, have thriving and surviving in this environment. So, yes, we need to develop robust responses to the activities of disruptive state actors, um, but... In order to do that, we have to arrive at a deeper understanding of, this, of, of the processes that structure them. So that, that's my kind of central point. Thank you very much. Thank you.